Yeah, I think that's great. Thank, thanks, Charlotte. Thank you. Great. Welcome everyone to the side event on the potential of technology for inclusive employment models. This event is part of the Zero Project Conference 2021. Worldwide, the Zero Project finds and shares models that improve the daily lives and legal rights of all persons with disabilities. This year, the conference theme is on employment and accessible ICT. For today's session, please consider promoting this event by using the Twitter hashtag ZeroCon21. My name is Charlotte McLean in Sapo, and I'm really delighted to be the moderator for this session. I'd like to welcome all of you to this session and also welcome our wonderful lineup of speakers we have today. What I'd like to do is to quickly mention them by name, and then I will share more about them later on as they take the floor. So first of all, we have Steve Tyler, Director of Assistive Technology at Lena Cheshire. Then we have Vashka Bhattarji, Accessibility Expert and National Government Consultant of Bangladesh, A2I program. We then have Julie Mignonso, Senior Disability Service Officer, National Council for Persons with Disabilities in Kenya. And then we have Rui Ranjan, Managing Director for Inclusion and Diversity Sponsor for Accenture Technology in India. And then we have Hector Minto from Microsoft Accessibility Ev Evangelist from Microsoft. It's important for me to note that this session has been organized by Lena Cheshire. And before we start, I'd like to just provide some of the standard housekeeping rules. First of all, we have live captioning available. Please check the closed captioning tool or click rather the closed captioning tool in, 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 the, in Zoom if you, if you need it. We also have international sign language interpreters who you will see pinned to the screen. The session will be recorded and it will be available afterwards for the Zero Project website. A quick word on the format of this session. The session itself will last for 60 minutes. And it has been designed so that we have one expert speaker, and in this case, it will be Steve Tyler, who will present on why technology is important in creating a leveling playing field for people with disability in terms of employment. We will then pivot to a panel discussion, discussion which will be followed by a Q&A session, which I will moderate. For this part of the, of the session, if you have any questions for the panel, please type them into the chat box and I will be able to pick them out and ask our speakers to respond to them. So, Let's get started with the content. This session aims to amplify two critical issues. The first issue is to better understand how technology and innovation are transforming access to employment for persons with disabilities. And we're going to do this by presenting some examples of what works. We're really interested in highlighting work and models that are scalable, that are sustainable, resilient, and of course, accessible. And then the second piece that we would like to focus on is to set out a vision for what the future of work looks like, a, a future of work that is supported by accessible and universal design. And we want to collectively think about what this would look like, who will drive it, how do we ensure that this vision is operationalized, and very importantly, how do we collaborate with others to make it happen? We definitely know that this can't be a solo expedition and that in order for it to succeed, we need to ensure that we're including member states, development partners, the private sector, organizations of persons with disabilities to really co-lead us forward to more inclusive and sustainable growth. And so with that, let's get to it. And I have the singular pleasure of introducing Steve Tyler. 
Steve Tyler currently serves as the Director of Assistive Technologies at Leonard Cheshire, where he has responsibility for policy, support and implementation of assistive technology solutions. He has a history in innovating sustainable and life-changing products in the accessibility arena, from leading the team that developed groundbreaking synthetic speech, leading to the voice of Alexa, through to accessible TV, mobile devices, payment systems, and online web and app accessibility initiatives. I'm going to hand over to Steve. Steve, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm assuming screen sharing is happening. Yes, it is. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I just wanted to start by sort of putting, uh, giving us a sense of, of where we are in the context of what we refer to as accessibility. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is leave you with a very clear message that technology is whatever it is today and will no doubt develop in places and areas where today we have no idea um, about where, where, where it's going to take us. But we also have a duty to guide where technology goes and ensure accessibility because it certainly is a game changer but it needs uh, careful management and it needs understanding and it needs a wider context to operate in. Second slide. And when I think about technology uh, more generally, you don't need me to tell you this. You know, we live in a world where Google is a verb. We live in a world where there's been a quiet revolution in some areas. Amazon has changed what it is to do online shopping and our belief systems and our expectations have been shaped by what Amazon and many others have done where we expect those of us that can get it on demand access to on demand everything whenever we want and if we don't get it within a few seconds well we lose interest and then there's been the not so quiet revolution in some areas, like in social media. All of these things have informed the possibilities for people with disabilities around access. And I suppose when I think about accessibility, I break it into various kind of broad arenas. First, mainstream access, the everyday laptop. And we all know Windows and Apple systems um, and the work that both Microsoft and Apple have been doing to revolutionize um, accessibility out of the box. Today, a great deal of accessibility is available from the device as soon as you turn it on. And that means access in lots of different ways to lots of different people. It means being able to speak to your computer. It means your computer speaking back to you. It means changing magnification. It means subtitles. So many different ways of operating from the most ingenious switch technologies um, for people with physical disabilities, right through to beginning to be able to control devices through eye movement and so on. So there's the mainstream kit, but with accessibility baked in. Then there's the more specialist kit, which is available today. Examples that we're working on include things like Grid 3. Grid 3, a Windows-based system, which is basically a communication system. It doesn't matter virtually whatever type of disability you have. There's almost certainly a, a way for you to interact through Grid 3 and similar propositions that give you access to everyday devices. And then thirdly, there's the, a glimpse of the future. Those areas that so far have been very difficult to tackle, like significant people with significant communications challenges, for example, 
there are now possibilities where we can um, use brain actuation technology to begin to control systems and devices. There are ways of rendering difficult to understand speech into easily understood speech. And for me, it means massive changes when you look back over 20 years. Today, I can access virtually any book I choose. Today, I can access virtually any system I choose. And if I can't access it, there are ways of making it happen. Third slide. So in a way, these are the challenges. Um, we talk about accessibility in the broader sense. That means making a product fit for whatever the user needs. And there are challenges in marketing and understanding and awareness of that. But nonetheless, accessibility is the broad umbrella. It's not a great way of describing it, to be honest, because accessibility means so many things to so many different people. Affordability, absolutely critical. Um, for people like me, with the wherewithal, uh, the education, the support, the work environment, etc., and the money to buy technology um, and to acquire it is, is, is you know, it, it has changed my world. But we also know that the World Health Organization estimates a billion people with disabilities and that 90% of those people don't have access to anywhere near what I've got access to. Availability, in other words, acquisition. How do you get hold of it? And by the way, how do you get hold of the right kit for the right job? People are very different. It's all very interesting. You know, when you talk about disability and, and one of the complexities around it is, of course, you know, everyone has different types of disability. Even in the visual impairment arena, there are something in the order of two and a half thousand different types of visual impairment that can be diagnosed. And then even within that, lots of complexity. Um, and I just wanted to, it's not on this list, but connectivity, we gradually have taken for granted, especially in the West, um, especially when we talk about collaboration and working on documents together and all of that stuff and the very thing we're doing now. Um, and indeed, COVID, if it's brought anything, has made us realize just how powerful this technology is, just how the world would be so very different if we weren't able to do what we're able to do today, uh, but also the challenges it brings with it. Next slide. Leonard Cheshire is an organization that's obsessed about partnership. Um, why? Because we've got the minor challenge that we set ourselves of ensuring that people with disabilities live, learn and work in the manner they choose. That's a small ambition. And in order to help us do that, we absolutely are reliant on partnerships. Partnerships around the world, and we operate in over 50 countries around the world, um, and then across the UK. An example of the kind of partnerships we've been doing uh, in uh, bringing employment to people and engaging in the employment sector is through our livelihood research uh, resource centers. So in Kenya, we're partnering with Fuzu, which is a, an online career portal there. In Bangladesh, we're focusing on BD Jobs, one of the biggest career sites on there. And what we're trying to do is digitize what I suppose was a more manual uh, task before, taking people through that process of getting acquiring a job. Identification of who these people are, where are they, what type of disability do they have, how can we attract them in. Assessing skills. And not just in that skills assessment process, it's actually changing often their ambition because people are where they are. People with disabilities that have a, are very resourceful and are fantastic at making do and mend and just accepting sometimes that the world is what it is and somehow they're going to get past that. Sometimes we're about skills development, but sometimes we're about filling people with ambition and hope. And then training and skills development through e-learning. And often it's a mix of e-learning and hubs and um, a mix of people 
uh, and, uh, and technology. Finally, job matching, making sure that they get to the right type of job that fits the bill for them, and supporting the, in the workplace um, with the appropriate technology solution. All the way through, these systems have to be accessible, websites have to be accessible, accessibility in every sense um, right across the journey. Next slide. Um, you will know that culturally we've got a way to go, even in places where we like to think of as rich nations, rich in culture and history and rich in finance and everything. In 2021 in the UK, 23% of recruiting managers in a recent poll said they would not recruit a person with a disability regardless of how equal the playing field was. 73% of people in the UK who lose their jobs um, and they didn't want to leave their job do so as a res direct result of either an acquired disability or, um, or, or, or an issue um, that would be classifiable within the legislation as a disability. So despite the movement in technology, despite the opportunities, despite the developments that I outlined earlier on, there is a huge cultural piece of work to do and we're nowhere near where we need to be and that only talks about um, uh, the West. Final slide. Um, please do engage with me offline. I'm always happy to learn and listen and understand even more of the area that I'm supposed to be expert in. Thank you. Steve, thank you for um, a really compelling and cogent presentation that began to provide us with a glimpse of the future. Uh, I, I think particularly showing the importance of technology as an enabler, but an enabler for all persons with disabilities, including people with significant communication tech, um, issue uh, disabilities. And I just wanted to pick up on the three A's, um, accessibility, affordability, and availability, really important. Um, but I also think an important point that you raised was the issue around connectivity and how that should never be taken for granted. And also just want to flag that, you know, I think ambition is good. Uh, big ambition is good, in fact. So with that, what I'd like to do now is to encourage uh, colleagues to put questions in the chat box and we will now pivot to our panel discussion, which will reflect on the future future of work and look at some inclusive solutions to, inclo to close the disability employment gap. Uh, we will look at how ICT has been an enabler in this regard. And of course, we will address the current context of COVID-19 and discuss how technology and innovations can support economic recovery to ensure that uh, no one is left behind. And so to do that, uh, we have six questions for each speaker. Each speaker has, uh, what? sorry, we have one question for each speaker and each speaker has six minutes. Um, and I would like to start off with Vashgar. Uh, Vashgar is uh, currently a national consultant for accessibility in the Access to Information Program of the ICT division in the Bangladesh, in, in Bangladesh government. Vashkar is involved in creating an enabling environment for innovations to come up for empowering persons with disabilities, which are then scaled up and made accessible to all. So Vashkar, my question to you is, what initiatives have you seen implemented in Bangladesh to promote innovation and technology to support disability employment generation? Um, thank you very much, Jackson. And I would like to say thank you to the Lena Cheshire Disability for inviting me as a panelist. And also, I am, feel honored to be part of Zero Projects. And I think I met you first time in Zero Projects in Vienna. So thank you. Um, you know, Bangladesh, uh, we call Bangladesh is a digital Bangladesh. So digital Bangladesh means now we have an opportunity to make it more inclusive and barrier free for all. Bangladesh is the first one of the first country who have ratified the UN Convention of uh, Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, 
followed by the UN CRPD, Bangladesh has adopted Persons with Disability Rights and Protection Act 2013, where there was a clear section for employment and also um, digital accessibility. That means legally, Bangladesh are committed to make their e-service and whatever employment related platforms, job portal must be accessible for all. Hence, A2I, an initiative of Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh, currently we are working under the ICT division, taken number of initiatives to make the service inclusive and accessible, such as we have a country's largest e-learning platform that is Muktapar. Now we are looking forward to make some e-learning content to create employment of people with disabilities, especially skill development content. And also Bangladesh government, ICT division are developing another e-learning platform only for persons with disabilities. We are expecting by mid of this year, we'll get that platform available for the people with disabilities. And all types of people with disabilities will get um, accessible, and inclusive e-learning content by which they will be skilled and empowered and ready for job market. Another innovation of the A2I, it is multimedia talking book. As you know, few years ago also, there was no accessible reading materials for people with disabilities in Bangladesh. When I was competed for the job market as a blind person, I never ever get a single accessible books for prepare prepare for the interview. Now we are making hundreds of multimedia books, accessible ebooks for the people with disabilities, learning disabilities, visual disabilities, screen disabilities. Then they can prepare for the job market. Bangladesh government has quota service for people with disabilities where um, in the 10% um, quota is allocated. 5% for orphan, 5% for uh, people with disabilities, even though it is not decided. But the problem is that the quota is not properly implemented. And we are seeing number of international and national organization are working to promote the rights of people with disabilities. As we saw, uh, they're trying to make the BD jobs accessible for the people with disabilities. BD jobs portal is one of the largest web portal for employment of people now it is becoming accessible and inclusive for all citizens with disabilities and also bangladesh government has taken initiative initiative to create more job by organizing a national level job fair by inviting um, it firms companies and startup groups and they're really giving some uh, incentive for the companies to recruit the people with disabilities. And we are all, another biggest opportunity has created as governments are now added a clause in the procurement process that their all web and application must be accessible. Hence, there is opportunity has created to, to recruit number of people with disabilities as a beta tester. Different companies are recruiting people with disabilities as a beta tester to test the website and application, um, uh, is it accessible or not? So this is another opportunity for the um, uh, youth with disabilities if they prepare themselves. You just learn all the positive things, but unfortunately, still disability is, a, is not a um, very important agenda of the community, society, and also um, uh, uh, for different sector. We are not finding Many people with disabilities are working in a decision-making forum. Such, I am only one who is working in a um, uh, such a status, uh, su such a position. But there is not many are getting these types of opportunity. We are not seeing many people with disabilities are working in INGO or or UN agencies. That is one biggest challenge for us because we need to create example for others by recruiting people with disabilities. Many projects are implemented, but people with disabilities are not part of them that as a staff. So we are now promoting these issues strongly 
we want to see without us nothing about us without us then we can make an inclusive society then we can achieve the sdg then uncrpd will become meaningful there is the un strategy un disability inclusion strategy we are not seeing much implication of that in country level i'm expecting through this webinar un agencies in our country will get a message that they need to be more inclusive and barrier free for all i hope um, um, you have um, enjoyed the uh, information which i have given remember as a person with disabilities i born in a rural village where there was no electricity no hospital i lost my eyesight since then my whole life was a struggle i was got an opportunity to go to japan to learn technology that was the turning point for my life i returned to my country i tried to solve the problem of the uh, people with disabilities by creating different innovation technology such as accessible dictionary accessible book reader multimedia talking book and and also promote the digital inclusion such as web accessibility etc and atwy was the key for my work thank you very much thank you for your thank passion thank you so much fashkar thank you so much fashkar for for sharing some of the work that's going on in bangladesh and also sharing a bit of your own personal journey i'd now like to introduce julie julie is a senior disability services office at the national council for persons with disabilities in kenya and my question to julie is what practical interventions have you seen implemented in kenya to close the disability employment gap harnessing the potential of technology over to you julie and you've got 6 minutes um okay thank you so much uh for us as a country there are several uh, policies uh several interventions that we've come up with and first and foremost our constitution of kenya that um clearly talks about uh you know the affirmative action on uh, 5% employment for persons with disabilities of course through this then um all uh, you know public and private sector uh, organizations or institutions are mandated to ensure that uh, there's the 5% employment of persons with disabilities we've gone ahead to um have that within the uh, we call it performance contracting of all uh, government agencies you know ministries and departments and they have to report to us as an institution on um, the progress they are making in terms of achieving the 5% implementation of uh, uh, employment towards uh, persons with disabilities um we also have of course uh, you know the persons with disabilities act that uh, clearly stipulates again you know um ensuring that these uh, employment towards persons with disabilities um we also have um, developed uh, the ncpwd career portal in partnership with um lena chesha that is the eye to eye project and um through this platform then now uh, we are able to bridge the gap in terms of uh, employers accessing persons with disabilities as well as um job seekers who are persons with disabilities accessing job opportunities and um we believe with this uh project and then uh, we are going to move a great you know mile in terms of um, having the progressive um 5% employment for persons with disabilities um we also doing a lot of uh, you know capacity building a lot of advocacy within the public and private sector just making them understand um the concept of employment and how then are they able to engage persons with disabilities in terms of uh, you know having accessible work environment um ensuring that uh, you know the policies that they develop within their workplaces are inclusive of persons with disabilities um you know as well as you know how their interaction is uh you know whether it's you know, good etiquette 
uh, uh, coming up with uh, you know social protection programs, whether you know it's insurance, um, whether it's uh, you know uh, return to work uh, programs for those that acquire disabilities within the workplace. Um, we also have, uh, uh, you know, various policies that the government has come up with in terms of, uh, you know, we have the Employment Act that clearly talks about, you know, um, uh, you know, not, not discrimination uh, to persons on the basis of, you know, their disability. Um, we also have the ICT policy that uh, clearly indicates on accessibility to information. And uh, through that, we've been able to see um, most of our government services have been digitized. And so on, then, uh, you know, whether it's persons with the physical impairments, then they can be able to access those services just at, uh, you know, a touch of a button. Uh, you know, persons with the you know visual impairment can be able again to access those services. Um, yes, there might not be. Uh, uh, you'd find that those that are not you know very accessible, but through you know engagements and um, you know partnerships with the various service providers and the various uh, government institutions within the you know. Uh, within the key uh, you know, service provision areas, then we are able to uh, improve on how then persons with disabilities can be able to access um, government uh, services. Um, we also, again, doing a lot of uh, you know, advocacy again to persons with disability so that they're, they're able to understand that um, the government has you know, these policies set uh, to be able to in, ensure inclusivity. And so they should be able to grab those opportunities, um, you know, doing a lot of mentorship programs uh, so that then they have, you know, um, good self-esteem to be able to take the courage and apply for jobs, not having to mind that, you know, I have a physical impairment, I have a visual impairment, and so I cannot be able to apply um, for this job. Um, of course, uh, again, uh, we, are, we are coming up with um, regulations to be able to, again, provide um, incentives to employers who engage persons with disabilities within the workforce, because then, um, you know, it's a win-win situation. So if I'm able to employ persons with disabilities, then what uh, benefits as an employer can I be able to get, you know, when I engage persons with disability? And so um, that is something we are working on between, uh, you know, the Kenya Revenue Authority and the other stakeholders to ensure that, uh, you know, there are those tax rebates to employers who engage persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we'll come, I'll come back to some of the points that you've raised at the end. Uh, but, you know, because of the time, I'd like to move to Rui. Uh, Rui is the Managing Director of Inclusion and Diversity Sponsor for Accenture Technology for India. Um, so the question to you, Rui, is uh, Accenture in India has been working for many years in developing solutions to support people with disabilities to maximize their potential. Can you share some organizational experience and practices in promoting disability inclusion in the workplace by supporting people with disabilities to have the right skills and competencies? And if you have time, could you also share your thoughts on the potential of technology and innovation to transform access to employment for persons with disabilities? And you have six minutes and I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. It's been a pleasure to be here. I just heard Steve Pasker and Julie talk about it. And, and it's very enlightening for me to be hearing from uh, the experience that they bring in. So I, I really feel that uh, businesses that will thrive in the economy of tomorrow really need to understand that you know, they have to cater to the needs of a 
very diverse population. And uh, I think we often, we uh, under recognize a group is with the, a group of people with disabilities. Uh, in fact, uh, providing increased access to technologies that meet the needs of a person with disabilities lays the foundation of a very inclusive workforce is our personal belief. And this will allow employees to thrive in an organization which, you know, which can learn from them tremendously. So I think Accenture probably you know, strongly believes that uh, enterprises can play a powerful role in ensuring technology helps bridge the gap for people with disabilities. And a major component is about of, of doing this is not only creating accessible workspaces, but also creating accessible technologies which take away barriers, uh, which are both hidden and visible. And I think every day since we've taken the pledge of being a technology accessibility program for our employees, the over 530,000 employees that come to Accenture every day, we just want to ensure that they are as productive as possible across technology landscape, irrespective of their abilities. So we are focusing on removing barriers for those who, who use technology in all sorts of ways, whether they use technology with or without a keyboard, with a mouse or without a mouse, or perhaps a screen reader, they should have the same experience. And I think uh, when I step back and look into my role and what we've been doing in India, I think there are a couple of things which I would highlight, which actually resonate to what Steve's been talking about. The first one that I wanted to talk about was empowering people with disabilities. And these are programs that we've taken to ensure you know, that we increase the employability of people with disabilities and, and enable them to advance in their careers. So this first program, which I wanted to talk about was an external skill building program where we are partnering with, uh, with NGOs, we are partnering with non-profit organizations to create a, a systemic change in the disability sector through you know, use of technology to help people acquire skills that will allow them to be uh, you know, employable and be successful in the careers that they want to take. So one such program we've talked about, we've created with the NGOs is called as Enable Wani. It's a rural program for social networking platform which enables people with disabilities to you know, call, give a missed call. You know, they don't even have to call. They, they, everybody's got a mobile. They can give a missed call to this number and be able to share their experiences on employment space, to be able to share their experience with the government schemes that are for people with disabilities and also on the welfare measures. Now, this has actually been, uh, this is available to about 70% of the Indian states. And what we've seen is in the last several months, there's you know, a call a minute is what we're getting today. So the, the success of this program is, is enormous because it gives people access to be able to give direct feedback on the programs that the government's running for them and whether they are employable or not. This is an intervention that we've created with the NGOs. There's another program which globally that we've launched is called as Skills to Succeed. Now, this is a program where we've partnered with the uh, NGOs to provide people skills which will allow them to be employable. And this has been a very successful program where our employees actually sit down with people and help them with their time and energy to be able to give them a skill which will allow them to be employed in technology sectors. And we've been very successful in employing people in retail, ITS, and BBOR opportunities. And the list continues. There's a program which we've recently launched in India called an inclusive internship program named ARAMP which I'm, I'm specifically associated with. This is for hiring graduates directly from colleges in India who have disabilities. This was a sector which was largely untapped in our country because we were not, we were not looking at employing people with disabilities. But I think with this program, what we're doing is we're directly taking people from, from colleges with an education background and then giving them an internship for about six months to be able to give them technology skills and give technology intervention with assistive technologies. So they, they have a real mainstream career in an organization like ours. So this provides youth, which is which is probably got to be sidelined, but what Julie was saying and what Bhaskar was saying, will not be able to do. Then there's a program called as Abilities Unleashed, which we run for, for our organizations, where we give leadership skills to our employees with disabilities. And I think all of this, as Steve mentioned, comes with a huge lot of commitment from an organization, 
from top down from leaderships to have goals to have measures to be able to continue working on assistive technologies for our employees and i think there's before i you know before i move on i just wanted to talk about the innovative you know accessible products that we are creating which will help our employees become you know uh, to be able to deliver on the work and i know charlotte i'm running out of time but it's very important for us to ensure that technology can become a differentiator and an enabler for our employees we are doing a lot of innovative products which will help our employees and i just wanted to end and say that you know we can talk about it separately these are available for access globally but unless we all come together and and are focused on creating a difference i don't think so we'll be able to do it thank, thank you, you rui and i'm sorry to rush you um no, I, there's so much there and we could have listened to you for so much longer but i do want to make sure that we give hector um his his time to to speak sure. um so hector has worked in the field of assistive technology alternative communication and special educational needs for over 20 years um, he's focused on emerging technologies and how to maximize its effectiveness across a, a wide range of, of types of disabilities. And my question to you, Hector, is as we're going through some fundamental shifts in the way we work due to um, COVID-19, what are your thoughts on harnessing the potential of technology to ensure people with disabilities are not left behind, but also very importantly, how can they access these products and services? So over to you, Hector. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And thank you to Leonard Cheshire for inviting me to join the panel today. Um, yeah, so COVID-19 has really shown, I think, what is inaccessible in society. I think people have been coping with the way things always were for so long. But suddenly, as we looked at a global pandemic hitting and people being forced into their homes and forced to access retail, access health, access education uh, digitally, it has really shone a light on just how inaccessible society is. Uh, you only have to look at the, the training that's given to teachers around the world. Uh, as soon as they were forced to kind of deliver all of their training and you know, their education, their classes virtually, there's a real lack of knowledge of, of just what's there to support children to learn, but actually also to support parents with disabilities. I think far too much of the conversation has actually been around the, uh, the, the student experience without recognizing that so many parents also have disabilities. Now, more widely, what we've seen is 10 years of digital transformation in six months. You will hear Microsoft people talking about this all across the world. People who were holding back on digital transformation and moving into the cloud or offering remote work to their employees They've absolutely raced at digital transformation. And the problem with racing, going too quickly, is you really do make mistakes. You know, you leave people behind. And so we've seen really worrying impact on the lives of people with disabilities. Uh, we've done some studies on this, and we've released a, a something last week, actually, called the New Future of Work Study, aka .ms forward slash new future of work. And what it shows is that double the amount of people with disabilities lost their jobs or went into furlough in the US. So 28% versus 51% of people with disabilities lost their jobs. And there was also coming out in the study, a deep fear of reskilling to get the new job for people with disabilities. What that means is people are suddenly having to think about they've lost one job and they're finding another job and they feel that they're behind already on reskilling, getting ready for that new work. So, so a real challenge there. We also saw uh, that video proliferated quickly. So, you know, we're here today at Zero Project on video uh, and not in person. What that did is it forced people with disabilities to disclose disability. So people who might have previously been hiding their, their ongoing deafness or their acquiring deafness or hiding their dyslexia, suddenly they were being forced to disclose disabilities because of this enforced way of working. Now, with disclosure, I would say, comes great opportunity. What I will tell you is, I mean, my main role at Microsoft Charlotte is to, is to work with huge companies around the world talking about the empowerment of people with disabilities and the tech that empowers. Suddenly, huge global organizations realized the people with disabilities they had within their organization, not just the ones who they want to bring in, but the ones that they had who weren't talking about it previously. And so this is fascinating as well and, and an opportunity I think that we need to, to jump on. Uh, Steve said it really nicely. There is so much built in tech that empowers people with disabilities from the captions in Teams calls to the blurred background for lip reading in Teams or the immersive reader to support people with reading difference 
dyslexia, low vision. Uh, all of this is built into modern technology, but the knowledge is not out there. People don't know that it's there. We have not worked hard enough to make sure that people know it's there. And so what we're doing as Microsoft is we're deliberately engaging with all of our customers around the world to ensure that they know that these features are built in to support their employees with disability. And there's an increased confidence to not just know who you've got, but also then start to employ more people with disabilities into the workplace and know that you can do so more confidently. Part of this is training. So we are also open sourcing all of our training. We've put out our accessibility training internally from Microsoft out to the public through MS Learn, our learning platform. People can reach that through aka.ms forward slash accessibility fundamentals. And you can essentially earn a qualification in accessibility at level 101, the basics. What is disability in the modern world? What is the technology that people need to use? And how do you build accessible experiences? Over 35% of Microsoft UK employees have taken that voluntarily because we have this culture of accessibility and very kind of clear visibility there. But we think we can move more towards mandating some of that training. And we also think we can work with our partner network uh, to really bring some of this uh, knowledge to customers all around the world. Remember, Microsoft employs approximately 150, 160,000 people globally. But when you think of the Microsoft partners who build technology out across the world, it is 30, 40 times that. So there's where the opportunity is for us to get more people with disabilities working in the tech industry, influencing the digital society that we're trying to build and that, and that we're building. So I would ask people to uh, not just look at Microsoft, but look at any technology vendor. And I include our, our trusted partners Accenture in this. You know, we have some great conversations with Accenture globally about disability inclusion and accessibility. But we're starting to move towards accessibility not being a DNI conversation only, but being a deliverable. It is honestly, it is that accessibility is deliverable technology. Yeah, but we need the people buying the technology, and frankly, the people selling the technology to have an increased confidence to have this conversation. Buyers don't know what it is. Sellers don't know what it is. <laughs> so we're not going to get anywhere until we have an increased representation and a baseline of knowledge that the technology that we can build in today's society is increasingly accessible. And so I'll leave you with uh, my last thought, which is innovation. Uh, again, uh, I was listening to Vashka talk about this. Um, how can people with disabilities get jobs in this new digital society if the very portals where people find their jobs are in themselves inaccessible? Uh, we recently saw the Swedish employment service put the immersive reader, the dyslexia tools from Microsoft into their mainstream platform so that suddenly people with low vision or people who are dyslexic or had low levels of literacy would be able to read those job adverts more easily. And it's very visible on their website. And my, my dream, <laughs> I think there's been a theme through the Zero Project about dreams, uh, but my dream is that we stop just looking to the mainstream technology providers to bring the, the operating systems in up to speed and the, and the tools and the magic, the assistive technology tools, but we also start to get the people building the digital experiences to start innovating as well for disability inclusion. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Hector. And you, you raised so many really important points. Um, I just want to flag that the, the new future of work, everybody should check that out. Um, the training, you know, definitely look at earning a qualification in accessibility. That's always a good thing to have on Let your me CV. Know. <laughs> and, just, and, and that's just really important. And I really like your point around access, access, accessibility, not just being a DNI issue, but being absolutely being a deliverable. So that's really an important point to take forward. We've got a couple of questions and we've got 10 minutes. And so what I'd like to do is to uh, perhaps take one, some of these questions. Um, and the first question goes to Steve. Um, and Steve, the question is a question around how do we ensure that persons with disabilities from the grassroots and, and ultra-poor families are, be, are benefiting from accessible technology? And I'll give you two minutes to answer that, Steve, that hugely complex question. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, it is complicated. Here are some shortcut answers. One, 
to Hector's point, there is technology right now, and we as organizations in the disability sector and other partners are not harnessing those enough. A good example, we know of a manufacturer that manufactures mobile, smart mobile devices running the Android system, not a feature phone, a high-end device, X factory price, $8.50. And if you buy one, we can get it for $14.50. That begins, now the importance of that is vast because built into the Android ecosystem is accessibility. Microsoft play in the Android ecosystem as they do in the Apple system, et cetera, et cetera. It brings connectivity and smartness. Secondly, we've learned a thing or two about community development, hub developments, the mix of people power and volunteering and family and friends and the power of family and friends and selling ambition into the disability community itself, making sure that they actually begin to demand and begin to want new things and demonstrating from the get-go, um, such as in some of the work we do um, in our education uh, field, where, for example, empowering girls, and more to the point, friends and family of girls, to recognize that actually you could transform this child into somebody who is a net contributor and transforming the view you have of her from being somebody who simply uses up resource. There's so much more I could say about it. It is complicated, but there are strategies and mechanisms that we have learned. We need to harness those and we need to have single visions in de disability organizations across the piece and harness all of us together to work in single vision unified ways. Thanks, Steve. That was a great response. So we have another question that's really more to how do we support small and medium sized companies to include persons with disabilities in their workforce? And how can we um, ensure that uh, they have provision of accessibility uh, in place? And perhaps Julie and Vashgar might want to answer this question. I think um, I'm just uh, responding like, you know, government need to give some subsidy. If they get some tax exemption, they may feel interested to employ the people with disabilities. Another biggest challenge is that the platforms where their infrastructures are not accessible. So government may support them to make this um, infrastructure and information accessible for the companies. Then they will become more um, uh, interested to employ the people with disabilities. Re reward is really needed. Thank you. Thank you, Vashka. Julie, would you like to come in here? Um, thank you, but I'll still, uh, you know, echo what uh, my colleague has mentioned about, uh, you know, coming up with um, the subsidies or coming up with, uh, you know, a small, either whether they are grants or something to SMEs that um, engage persons with disabilities. And at the same time, I think just um, you know changing the attitude uh, about persons with disabilities because most of the time people would believe that uh, you know um, whether it's an SME within the manufacturing sector, whether it's the, is an SME within uh, you know production and everything, and so then the thought that persons with disabilities cannot be able to engage in such um, you know hands-on uh, you know skills. And so one, I believe for us to be able to, um, you know, uh, to be able to uh, have more persons with disabilities engage within SMEs, I think it's first to change the attitude that, you know, um, the society has and especially the, you know, the SME sector that persons with disabilities cannot be able to engage in, you know, some, um, some uh, you know, activities. Um, secondly, is uh, you know again support from uh, you know different from government in terms of uh, having accessible um, you know uh, engagements with persons with disabilities. 
for instance, if, uh, if it's an SME dealing in the manufacturing sector, then how then can we be able to support this SME uh, have persons with disabilities on board? So um, for me, attitude and uh, you know support. Excellent, thanks, Julie. I'm going to go to Hector now. There's a question for you, and uh, it the question is that Teams is not great for people with hearing disabilities. Is there?